Welcome everyone to today's webinar. The title is Swings of Extremes, Sex and the Trauma Survivor with Gabriella Grant. Uh, we're very excited to welcome Gabrielle as our guest expert today. Um, let me first just tell you a little bit about CHS, Center for Healthy Sex, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about Gabrielle Grant, and then we'll get started. So Center for Healthy Sex is a sex therapy, sex addiction treatment center in Los Angeles. Um, we have individual therapy, group therapy in our intensives. Right now we have space open in our upcoming men's 11-day sex and love addiction intensive. May 16th through 27th. We also have space June 6th through 11th in our six-day partner relational trauma intensive. And then June 13th through 24th, we have some space in our women's 11-day sex and love addiction intensive. And we only accept four clients for these intensives so that they can have the maximum individual attention. We also offer 12-session Skype classes. So if you'd like any more information about our how we how these um, these services we offer to people in Los Angeles and outside Los Angeles. You can call our intake counselors at 310-843-9902. I also want to draw your attention to our book, Mirror of Intimacy. Um, it's, this weekend it's being awarded the Clark Vincent Award uh, by California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. We are also on the shortlist for the Eric Hoffer Book Award Grand Prize, which we find out on Monday, whether we won the grand prize or our category of self-help. And the paperback version, this version, goes on sale on Wednesday. So that's our book. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Gabriella. Gabriella Grant is the director of the California Center of Excellence for Trauma-Informed Care. I'm getting a call. Uh, located in Santa Cruz, California, and she oversees the center's research program and professional development as well as policy and analysis activities. And she convenes the Santa Cruz Trauma Consortium and the annual fall trauma conference. She has a master's of arts in public policy from the John Hopkins University. And she's worked with criminal justice agencies, the courts, social service agencies, and public health departments to create trauma-informed transformation and programming related to substance abuse, PTSD, eating disorders, problem gambling, domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. Her background includes heading the nation's first community corrections-based victim advocacy program, which was for the Maryland Division of Parole and Probation from 1996 to 1999. And she also ran a three-year project funded by the California Department of Public Health to increase access to domestic violence shelters by women with mental health or, and or substance abuse issues. And that was from 2006 to 2009. So welcome, Gabriella. So happy to have you here and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and welcome everybody on the line. I am delighted to be here. And um, you know, I was invited to, um, to speak on this webinar for the Center for Healthy Sex. And, um, I've never actually done a sex-specific topic, so this is going to be new for me and, and hopefully uh, informative to you all, but I'm, I'm, I'm very open uh, to constructive uh, feedback uh, related to this topic. Um, we're also, at the end, I'm going to show you that we have a conference in Santa Cruz in October uh, that's also looking at this intersection between trauma and sexuality. Uh, so this year, 2016, has definitely been uh, uh, having a sex focus that um, I have not been focusing on up till now. So it's pretty exciting. All right. So we're going to be talking about the uh, swings of extremes, which I talk about uh, in terms of treatment, um, as well as in terms of training to understand trauma survivors a lot. Tom, I don't think that you mentioned that I actually conduct a treatment. It's called Seeking Safety uh, for Women. It's a drop-in group. It's been going on for almost seven years. About 650 women have dropped in on that group at one point or another. I also oversee Seeking Safety, uh, which is an evidence-based treatment uh, being conducted in the local Santa Cruz County jails, uh, which is primarily a male uh, population. So I personally conduct Seeking Safety with women, and then I oversee clinicians that are uh, doing Seeking Safety primarily with men who are incarcerated. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed over the years of working with trauma survivors is that uh, folks tend to swing into various extremes in their own behavior. And it is the extremity of that behavior that actually mirrors and replicates the extremity of the trauma. 
the pervasiveness, the chronicity of that trauma. So um, we could have, you know, with regards to um, sex and sexuality, you know, relatively um, minor swings and, you know, we could even call them healthy swings. Uh, where people kind of go a, a little bit back and forth, but that's not really what we're going to talk about uh, today. We're going to talk about really kind of serious swings of extremes where one person is um, totally cut off from their sexual selves, deny their sexual selves, shut down their sexual selves, their intimate selves um, entirely. Uh, I've known people who, you know, have not had an intimate relationship for decades. Um, who, except for some of the most superficial interactions, don't have any interactions with human beings. So that would be one extreme. And then the other extreme, which, you know, if you're working in the sex addiction field, you might be a, a little bit more familiar with, are folks that can't stop having sex, lots of sex, uh, with multiple people under, you know, extremely dangerous situations where um, their safety is uh, very much at risk. So, so those are really these swings of extremes that we're going to be talking about today. And I'm hopeful to give everybody some information about really conceptually, theoretically, why that happens. Um, but then on a much more tangible and concrete basis, what we can do in order to help people move towards their opposite, to create more stability, to create um, a, a, a safer, healthier, more connective uh, expression of oneself uh, post-trauma. All right. So um, as we move forward today, um, uh, you're going to see that there's a lot of sets of three um, that uh, we're going to define trauma in terms of uh, kind of three bubbles. Uh, we're going to look at um, sexual um, sexual response in terms of three bubbles. Uh, we're going to look at trauma identification in terms of three bubbles, and then we're going to also treatment planning in terms of three bubbles. So there's going to be a lot of these threes. So you can notice um, if threes kind of come up in your treatment, um, in your life, uh, if these threes are something that can that can be helpful to you. So many people here may be familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences study um, conducted by Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, California, and then ultimately the data set taken over by the Center's for Disease Control and Prevention, a uh, federal agency located in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's a prospective retrospective study of 17,000 Kaiser members looking at uh, the connection, association, and causal uh, relationship between early adverse childhood experiences and later in life uh, interpersonal, behavioral, and physical health problems. And Dr. Vince Felitti uh, was one of the principal investigators of that study. And he says what is conventionally viewed as the problem is actually the solution to a prior unrecognized adversity. So if I'm looking at somebody who is, you know, again, on these swings of extremes, um, you know, uh, compulsively sexual, uh, putting themselves in dangerous situations, going around dangerous people, uh, or alternatively, that person who's totally cut off from their sexual selves and other people, um, those behaviors uh, from this trauma-informed context are first looked at as solutions, uh, not as the problem. They're a problematic, <laughs> they become problematic in the life of the individual, but their first, their first purpose, their first arrival on the scene was almost always as a solution to a prior, often unrecognized adversity. So it doesn't make sense, and people are often ambivalent when the, the treatment course or their friends or their family or their spouse is simply telling them to abstain from that behavior. You know, stop isolating, go and meet people. Uh, stop having sex with people, uh, you know, stay home, I suppose, <laughs> would be the advice. Um, so instead, what, what we want to do is first kind of use trauma as the context. Why would a traumatized person see compulsive sexual activity as a solution? And what would it be a solution to? It kind of gives us immediate uh, understanding, compassion, and a treatment framework for what we actually want to achieve. Um, but then the other thing is, is that um, the treatment that I'm going to propose, which is a safety-oriented treatment, is really focusing on increasing safety and seeing if some of these extreme behaviors tend to move towards their opposite, relatively un, 
uh, dramatically, that, that there's a natural remission of the unsafe behavior, that there's a, a natural kind of uh, a reduction in the extremity of the swings of extremes. Uh, I mentioned that, that folks kind of go into these swings of extremes. Uh, I didn't mention, but I want to mention that some folks swing back and forth between these extremes. So we can see, for example, somebody who is totally cut off with, from their sexual selves, uh, very, you know, kind of alone, isolated, and then they're like, oh, I've got to, you know, get out there. And they go out, you know, classic, get drunk, go to the bar, you know, get online, something like that, meet somebody real fast, real quick, um, maybe even engage in some pretty serious sexual activity, but then they feel bad, they feel maybe even shame, or um, it didn't work, it was dangerous, it, you know, it got them robbed, any number of different things, and then they swing back over to this uh, shut down, shut off uh, self. So our goal uh, in terms of treatment is going to be slow, building safety, and then seeing uh, if we can make slow movements towards our opposite. So a sexually active person who really enjoys sex, you know, is probably going to stay sexually active and enjoying sex, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, an individual who maybe doesn't enjoy sex that much, who, who doesn't really um, enjoy people that much, they're probably going to stay in this zone too. Uh, but we've got options once we move away from these extremes of how to still uh, meet our sexual needs and if we have intimacy uh, needs as well, which most people do, but not everybody, that we can meet those needs in safe ways with safe people. So I use a set of three definition of trauma and uh, let's see if my uh, little uh, arrow kind of shows up right here. But I'm, uh, I'm up at the top, extreme threat. And neuroscientists tell us that when children are exposed to extreme threat, combined with inadequate caregiving response, they develop a nervous system that is unable to internally modulate itself. Um, that a hardwired uh, ability to um, both uh, modulate the nervous system, care for self, and be aware of threat in one's environment becomes continuously less present to that individual. And that's actually going to be our definition for trauma for our purposes in today's webinar. Uh, trauma is an overwhelming event that overwhelms this person's uh, particular capacity to cope and care for self and results in a loss of safety. And as a matter of fact, a shorthand that I use with a lot of clients and a lot of people to really talk about uh, trauma in very practical ways is that trauma is a loss of safety. Uh, of course, if we have the extreme threat or the overwhelming event being, for example, child sexual abuse, sexual assault, uh, relationship violence, domestic violence, sex-related or sexuality-related uh, events, then um, the uh, overwhelming event uh, very well can be very associated in condition to sexuality, sexual response, uh, sexual intimacy. And so we're going to look at that very particularly today. But it's not just this extreme threat. It's not just that um, this thing happened to me. It's also that early in life, uh, very often, I did not receive the adequate caregiving response to earlier extreme threat. Uh, it was denied. I was blamed. Nobody was there. It was the person caring for me that was also the extreme threat. Um, all of these things actually becomes a, uh, a response that I have built in. I, I call it a message. It's a message that's kind of built into my coping uh, strategy, which is don't care, don't care for self, ignore, um, uh, kind of distance yourself from your body sensations, uh, uh, don't cope, don't care. Uh, it'll go away if I pay no attention to it. And not only is this overwhelming event uh, overwhelming this person's capacity to cope, very often based on their early caregiving relationship, but it leads to this loss of safety. That when my nervous system is unable to modulate itself, I am disproportionate in my reading of the environmental cues and my body sensations. And basically, what that is telling my nervous system is that I'm not safe. And I'm going to do things, both protective things and self-regulatory things, in order to try to function, have relationships, move forward, not appear impaired, any number of different things. 
So what this means is, therefore, we can um, have a treatment that's also kind of three bubbles as well. So the first bubble is to reduce exposure to overwhelming events, uh, unsafe, dangerous, um, humiliating uh, circumstances that are likely to lead to you know, these conditioned responses. Um, the word that uh, we're going to use in terms of treatment is no. So the way that I can help my clients to reduce exposure to overwhelming events is to develop the capacity to say no and hear no. Already in terms of sexuality, we see something kind of pretty obvious, which is that many people who have these swings of extremes are unable to say no and or unable to hear no. So if I'm unable to hear no or say no, I might swing over into this totally cut off thing because I don't even want to put myself in that situation where I can't protect myself. So here's how I'm going to protect myself. Total and utter shutdown and isolation. Or I go over here, swing over on this side. I am unable to say no, unable to, to hear no. And so I'm going in an all yes direction. That it's all yes, all the time, never say no, just yes, 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 yes. So one of the things that I'm going to be working on in terms of treatment is this ability to say no and hear no. We're also going to see that this ability to hear no and say no is not just pro forma saying no, hearing no. It's also starting to notice what are the body signals uh, deeply uh, ingrained in my system. When I say no, something terrible is going to happen. When I hear no, I'm being rejected or denied or my existence uh, uh, is, not, uh, is, is not guaranteed to continue uh, when I'm told no. An another area of treatment is to increase capacity to cope and care for self. Um, this involves first and foremost listening and becoming aware of the body sensations and body signals that our bodies are telling us. Um, in modern society, we have a very strong tendency to cut our physical selves off not listen to our body responses. Uh, this might actually lead me into some pretty extreme sexual situations so that I can feel, so that my body does signal something to me, uh, which I neurobiologically need and therefore might feel compelled to put myself into those situations. So we're going to learn um, that we can increase capacity to cope safely with our body signals in order to meet our needs, that our body is talking to us for a reason. We have these valid needs we can meet them uh, as safely as possible. And then finally, increasing physical and emotional safety. And here, in terms of treatment, what I really look at with my clients, and, and, and my clients can identify uh, their own areas that they want to increase physical and emotional safety, but for our purposes today, we're really talking about sexuality, um, is uh, identifying and reducing any unsafe thought process, behavioral process, or relationship process um, that our client wants to reduce um, for our purposes today in terms of sexuality. Um, so reducing unsafe thought processes, you know, sex is dirty or I'm dirty, uh, um, if that's an unsafe behavior, and um, an unsafe thought for the person that they feel shame or guilt, for example, afterwards, or they punish themselves uh, for having these thoughts, for example. Unsafe activities um, hanging around dangerous people engaging in dangerous activities, um, and unsafe relationships that in order for me to uh, you know, get these uh, body sensations going, I need to put myself into extreme relationships where my autonomy, where my uh, ability to, uh, to respect myself and not to be humiliated are often a, a price that I have to pay in order to get these needs met. Now, I just want to say, if individuals feel totally comfortable with extreme sexuality, uh, humiliation, or you know any any number of different things that can come come out, that's not what I'm talking about. So it's it's really that the individual themselves has identified the situation as unsafe, not that I've identified the situation as unsafe for them. So um, th there's a definitely a lot of uh, information uh, that I will provide about safety, what safety is. Um, are you able to say no? Are you able to hear no? Are you able to cope safely with the situation? And is it a situation that you can manage or is it a situation that overwhelms you and then propels you into more unsafe behaviors? So um, I'm going to try definitely not to be at all anything but sex positive. 
uh, through this entire uh, presentation, while still recognizing that there is this intersection between trauma and sexuality and things get a little bit murky. So in case folks were um, thinking that my definition of trauma is kind of like my own or kind of off the wall, uh, this is actually identical to the official uh, definition of individual trauma from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, which really has been at the forefront of promoting trauma-informed transformation uh, throughout the United States. And, and for those of you who are international, you, know, you guys can benefit from uh, this work as well. So SAMHSA says that individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by that individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that results in a lasting adverse effect on the individual's functioning, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And today, of course, we're looking at lasting adverse effects on uh, sexual well-being, sexual functioning. That's really what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, here's another three. Uh, we can identify trauma in three different ways. So the classic way, the way that's kind of always uh, the go-to way of identifying trauma is to get disclosure about traumatic events. Uh, that is one way to do it, and there are plenty of cost-free, copyright-free screening tools to identify traumatic events. Um, there is no um, actual clinical need that our clients have to disclose a traumatic event in order to get trauma treatment. It's kind of a, an interesting paradox. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that if we have time. But we can ask about trauma on a voluntary basis while giving people the legal uh, as well as ethical uh, as well as respectful uh, 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 ability to say no, that they don't want to disclose these events. They don't even want to look at the list. Perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, the reason why I even bring these lists to my group is so that people, first of all, can see a category of these are traumas. Whether you tell me what you've experienced or not, you now know that there is this category. These things are called trauma. So what was told to me was love, what was told to me what was good, what was told to me what happened to my father, my mother. Now I see, no, it's actually in this category called trauma. Hmm. That's usually plentiful food for thought. Uh, but there's another reason that I ask about uh, or I give people a list of traumatic events and call them trauma and uh, let them know that they don't have to disclose anything to me, uh, which is that most trauma survivors tend to have a almost non-conscious disproportionate attribution of power of the perpetrator, that the perpetrator uh, directly told them that terrible things will happen if they ever disclose trauma. And so it's really not to get the disclosure of trauma <laughs> that we even want to ask about these events, but that in asking about these events, and where the, the client can choose either to disclose or not to disclose, that it is their choice one way or the other, that it is actually reducing uh, that disproportionate attribution of power to the perpetrator, that that in and of itself is treatment. So there's another way for us to identify uh, uh, trauma, and that is through symptoms. Uh, John Breer out of USC has done exceptional work in this regard, and I highly uh, recommend uh, his work. He's got a cost-free copyright-free diagnostic tool called the Tra Trauma Symptom Checklist 40 that is not age-specific. He also has some costed tools, uh, and some of his stuff is actually no longer costed, so it kind of fluxes and changes depending on, I'm not sure exactly what, but um, highly recommend that you check out John Briere and his Trauma Symptom Checklist. Again, the checklist is not to necessarily diagnose a person, although that is uh, what it was designed to do, but what I use it for much more is for people to have this list. These are trauma symptoms. Number 36 or 37 on that list is the desire to physically hurt other people. So uh, I have a lot of clients <laughs> that, uh, that have a uh, desire to physically hurt other people and themselves. And rather than thinking that that's them, that they're uh, antisocial or that they're um, psych psychopaths or that they're terrible people uh, that they need to control themselves around, that now they get to see actually that is the 36th most common trauma symptom, probably even more common than that, but uh, there's some social opprobrium if we disclose it. So it's, it's lower down on the list than it would be otherwise. So I, I, I want to give people this list of these physiological and relational uh, symptoms 
because it allows us to see that it is something that can change. It's not an immutable characteristic in my own, uh, you know, characteristic uh, makeup. And then finally, and this is really the area of the work that I do, uh, which is looking at uh, unsafe behaviors, that unsafe behaviors are both a disclosure of past trauma, an attempt to solve the trauma problem, and uh, unfortunately keeps the individual trapped in captivity of those past traumas, whether personal early relational traumas or maybe even gener generational traumas or even uh, historical traumas. And whether uh, those traumas are personal, intergenerational, or historical, uh, there has consistently been um, a thread around the physical body, uh, the sexual self, uh, relational uh, oppression. Uh, so we can see how um, sex is involved in, in all of those aspects as well. So um, I'm just going to say that I have a pilot study on a tool which is called the Unsafe Behaviors Inventory, uh, which looks at 88 categories of unsafe behaviors, including sexual behaviors that uh, trauma survivors often uh, in, uh, involve themselves in. And um, I don't have a big enough data set, so if you're interested in uh, collaborating, please send me an email and um, I can get you uh, hooked up into that pilot study. Uh, but from some of our early data, what we've seen is even with no treatment, individuals who take the unsafe behaviors inventory and then take it eight, eight weeks later, we've seen a reduction in these unsafe behaviors. That really focusing in on safe and unsafe to you, not immoral, moral, right, wrong, healthy, unhealthy, but actually safe, unsafe is a, um, a switch. It's a, it's, a, it's a conceptual change around one's own person, uh, one's own ability, one's own self-protection, one's own needs. Uh, outside of the rest of the world uh, that tends to be very, very helpful for the trauma survivor. So um, I read in preparation for this uh, webinar uh, a very good book that uh, just recently came out, although I did not write the uh, publication date, uh, Come As You Are by Emily uh, Nagoski. Uh, it's really good. Uh, highly recommend it. The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life. So if folks haven't had a chance to read that, um, it is uh, now available uh, wherever you buy your books. So in here, she talks about sexual response. And it really struck me when she talked about it because it's the definition of trauma <laughs> that I use all the time and that I, I, I base trauma recovery on. And it was identical. So basically what Nagoski says is that there is, in terms of sexual response, three layers that are often collapsed and therefore not distinguished uh, between and among, um, but kind of we kind of stay stuck in the perception aspects of it. Um, but let's check it out. We can also stay stuck in some other stuff. But uh, what Nagoski says is that there is a context around which this sexuality is happening um, in a bedroom, you know, on a beach, uh, on a yacht, <laughs> you know, in, in a movie theater, uh, that there is this context. And then there's my own body sensation. So I'm liking it, I'm not liking it, it's making me feel these ways, it, it's kind of uh, soliciting some, some, some sexual feelings in me or, or not, uh, as the case may be. And then she talks about perception, that as a result of this context and this body sensation, I end up with what she calls a perception, but I would actually call it an evaluation. Uh, that I now evaluate this situation, I like this, this feels good. I don't like this, this feels bad. But what is the this? What is the this? And what uh, Nagoski talks about in her book is, is it the context that is making this feeling uh, lead to my perception or evaluation that I don't like it? Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, uh, I'm fooling around with my partner, um, but we're, you know, out, out, outside of the park and there's a whole bunch of people around. Is that what, is, is it the context that's making me feel, perceive that this situation is not of my liking? Is it my body sensation? Is it a combination of the two? So because this sexual response as described by um, a sex therapist um, looks exactly like my definition of trauma, uh, I became incredibly interested in really understanding trauma even from this perspective, that it was context, body sensation, and then the perceptual evaluation that the trauma survivor makes that then gets coded and becomes a, a reinforcing cycle and dynamic. When my body feels this way, 
uh, the context is a dangerous or when the context is like this, my body should or should not feel this way. We can start to see how the trauma survivor uh, in trying to make sense and trying to function and trying to have uh, healthy relationships often is misperceiving, misreading uh, both their own body signals as well as context. And then I become ever more disconnected and ever more confident in my ability to protect myself, to manage my own emotions, and to be able to uh, pay attention to my safety. So Nagoski tells us about perception, and perception is something that is very important in terms of sexual response. Um, and I, I really contemplated this perception business, and I've come up with um, at least my uh, understanding of what perception is, where I really use this word evaluation very strongly. So um, I'm seeing perception to be a kind of an interactive filtration system. And um, I saw it really as a dialectic, that we have the thesis context, we have the antithesis, my in, so external context, the antithesis, my internal body response, and then we have the synthesis, this is my evaluation of the situation. This is good. This is bad. I like this. I don't like this. Uh, I feel uh, happy here. I don't feel happy here. So uh, once again, these three bubbles or these sets of three kind of really propose our, themselves in a way that I think uh, requires us to pay attention individually to each one of these aspects. That if we don't piece apart these three bubbles, uh, we can often be talking to our clients, to ourselves, to our partner, about our perceptions, which they often have made a different evaluation of. Their body signals are different, their historical understanding of context are different, and now we have two battling perceptions. You know, I don't feel turned on by what you're doing. Oh, you should feel turned on because I feel turned on by this thing. So, you know, we can really see how it's piecing it apart that allows us to really examine what is um, going on in terms of our context, in terms of our body signals, and thus um, resulting in this evaluation or perception. So as trauma survivors have heard throughout the centuries and millennia, um, there's often a, if there's no you know, obvious wound to the body, uh, a lot of people are told, you know, it's just in your head. Oh, I perceive, um, you know, I, I feel like everybody is you know, sexually demanding of me, for example. Um, I have a lot of clients who, who uh, actually feel that way, that, that everybody is demanding sex of me. Um, so that is in your head, but it's not just in your head. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because, you know, trauma survivors have been told, oh, it's just in your head, and it's not just in your head, but it is also in your head. And that this perception business, maybe we can start to see what do I have immediate control over that I can actually verify by using objective data, objective uh, pieces of information to see, is it just in my head? And therefore, is there something that I can do about it to either protect myself or to manage these feelings? Or is it not in my head and perhaps something dangerous is going on that I need to protect myself from? Or is it something that I need to manage my emotions around? So it becomes constantly this awareness between physical safety, the context, and emotional safety, the body signal. And when those two things are working well together, my ability to perceive my environment becomes much more accurate. Um, all right. So uh, Nagoski talked about uh, perception uh, in ways that were very, very interesting to me. Um, so uh, I've constantly been focused on our five senses. And with sexuality, with, the, with sex in general, we have a lot of sensual uh, processes and function very much uh, activated during sex, uh, which regulates the nervous system, which allows our bodies to function in ways that are very, very crucial for our survival. So we're compelled uh, to get these needs met. Um, and we can see with sex uh, that taste, touch, hearing, smell, and sight are all very activated uh, uh, during uh, sexual activity. But Nagoski also mentioned that there are other aspects of, uh, of, of, of perception, of sense, that we're not always as familiar with as our, our, our five senses. So she talks about proprioception, which folks I'm sure have heard about uh, over the years, which is your sense of self in space, and that when your proprioception is off, that there can of often be kind of like Alice in Wonderland effects, that you feel very small or very large, 
or that there's these kind of odd movements, kind of like this, this webcam right here, uh, that my proprioception is a little bit off. Uh, when I'm moving around on this uh, webcam. Folks may be familiar with equilibrioception, our sense of balance. Uh, if you go on a boat or maybe even an amusement park ride, um, when you get off, we're often off balance. And that nausea often happens when we are off, off balance. Uh, it turns out that our inner ear and the soles of our feet are very crucial uh, in aspects of our body in terms of equilibrioception. Uh, we also have something that's called nociception, which is our sense of pain. Uh, in terms of, you know, sexual activity, uh, we often see people who, who prefer either a little bit or maybe even a lot of pain in order for them to become more aware of what is going on, in order for them to have a, a more um, uh, intense sexual experience. Uh, but we also know people who are over on this other swing uh, who can't handle even being touched that, that it's, it's so painful, just the, the physical touch of another human being, it feels like an acid burn. Uh, so um, I want to tell my clients about this thing called nociception. And um, Nagoski also talks about chronoception, a uh, sense of time. Um, many of us know that uh, when we're, you know, for example, <laughs> you know, it, it, in the company of somebody who we enjoy, who we find attractive, uh, who we're really uh, kind of getting along with, time tends to go pretty fast. Um, and then when we're in the actual sexual activity, uh, sometimes things speed up, but very often things kind of slow down. Uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not sure maybe many of you know that the average, uh, you know, time of uh, beginning of coitus to end of coitus uh, is actually very short <laughs> in many cases. I think the average is very, very short. Um, but there's, you know, all of this focus on, on something that's actually a very, very short time span. Um, and for some people, uh, they get lost in that very short time span. It seems like a lot longer than <laughs> a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, uh, as the case may be. Uh, be. But we also have folks who are very uh, acutely aware of time. Uh, these are individuals who often uh, have a hard time relaxing in terms of sexuality, that they are feeling the, um, uh, the sand grains of time dropping as they're lying there uh, with this other person or by themselves, that they can't um, detach from their chronoception enough to be able to relax enough to enjoy the sexual experience. So all of those are fascinating in terms of sexuality all by themselves, and I recommend the book, but I'm actually going to add in one that wasn't in the book, and that's what I'm going to focus in on, which is called neuroception, and this is uh, Stephen Porges's uh, polyvagal theory. And our neuroception is our sense of safety in uh, the moment. Um, and we're going to see that neuroception allows us to determine non-consciously, but using sensory awareness, of whether we're safe and able to engage in social uh, engagement, including uh, sexual activity with another person, or we're in danger, which um, activates our mobilization defense, which is generally fight and flight. And we can see some fight and flight behavior in terms of sexual activity uh, as well. And the final one, which is uh, life threat. And that when our nervous system perceives that we don't have any choice, that we can't say no, that our autonomy has been removed, um, that there is no escape, uh, we actually shut down and can look compliant um, and that that uh, situation is actually a very, very dangerous situation for all of us to be aware of, uh, both as treatment providers, um, sex therapists, as well as uh, sexually active uh, adults as well. So really we're talking about neurobiology. Trauma is neurobiological. Sexuality is neurobiological. And where these swings of extremes come in, um, sexually speaking, is through our nervous system, through our neurobiology. Uh, so here we have the polyvagal theory, uh, Stephen Porges's work. Um, if folks have not already read uh, Dr. Porges's polyvagal theory, I highly recommend it. It's, it's pretty re revolutionary in a lot of ways. Uh, it looks at our nervous system really as a dialectic, uh, which is that when, I, when my body is perceiving that um, I have choice, that I have autonomy, that I can protect myself, that I can say no, and you uh, are also exhibiting 
that you are non-threatening to me, that you are not going to take my life, for example, even on a very, very primitive level, uh, then my nervous system synthesizes, you know, that there is a dialectical synthesis um, in terms of being able to uh, be socially engaged, uh, to be able to have eye contact, prosody, uh, facial expressions that look like I am, you know, enjoying myself. And uh, we also see that this safety business promotes visceral homeostasis, that it allows for good health in the gut, um, as well as um, the uh, vagal nerve giving me information, not only from my gut, but also uh, it passes through the heart, the ventral vagal nerve passes through the heart, enervates the vocal cords, the facial muscles, the muscles around the eye, and then um, it starts from uh, and ends back up in uh, my brainstem. So I, I really want to start to see that our traditional understanding of the nervous system, which looks at you know either your uh, calm, what we call rest and digest, the parasympathetic nervous system, or we're under threat, fight and flight, is actually a very simplified version of what our nervous system is all about, according to uh, Stephen Porges. Um, that it's not as though I'm either fighting and fleeing or I'm resting and digesting. It's actually when I perceive safety, I'm socially engaged. I'm aware, I'm, a, I, I'm having, you know, I mean, calling it stress isn't exactly the right word, but I'm definitely having um, action-oriented, uh, you know, motivations in my life. Let's go do something socially. Let's even have sex, for example. So um, another thing in terms of sexuality that I really want to focus in on is that compliance or not saying no is not the same as safety and consent. So very often perpetrators, uh, you know, perpetrators of sexual abuse, sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera, um, they often defend themselves saying, well, you know, she never said no, he never said no, they never, you know, looked like they were dissenting. So we can see that we as human beings have an ability to subjectively interpret people's behavior, that we interpret subjectively people's consent. So one of the things that I'm going to do in my treatment, one of the things I'm going to do in my life, and one of the things that I'm going to do in my relationships is really get, um, uh, first, build this ability to say no and hear no, but then to actively uh, listen for consent. And if I have not heard uh, active utterance of consent, yes, I need to ask for it. I cannot move forward. So assumption of consent, uh, we've really kind of moved beyond in California where I'm from. We have a yes is yes law happened last year because no means no. Uh, if there is no no, then that means, must mean yes. So now we've moved into active utterance. Uh, yes means yes and only yes means yes. And we see from a nervous system perspective uh, that that makes a lot of sense. But yet, uh, for those of you who have been working with trauma survivors, uh, you also know that there is often a deeply encoded nervous system message that your life will be over if you say no or if you hear no. So we're, we're always going to have to uh, contend with building the skill of saying no before we emphasize the skill of saying yes. So uh, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, in his original article called The Body Keeps the Score, but now he's got a whole book called The Body Keeps the Score, says that uh, once traumatized people learn to reorient themselves to the here and now, then it's in that moment that they can experiment with re reactivating their lost capacities to physically defend and protect themselves. So, you know, it's interesting what I usually focus on in my, uh, uh, with my women clients is, uh, you know, this capacity to relationally defend yourself. Uh, we're actually not not that much focused on um, connection, <laughs> but rather how to how to protect. Uh, so uh, most of my treatment is is much more focused on protection rather than connection. But we do emphasize connection, uh, safe connections, um, uh, all the time. And I also see this natural uh, tendency that once the women who are coming to my group are able to protect themselves, are able to say no and hear no, are able to set boundaries, are able to perceive their safety and have that communicate non-consciously but sensory awareness-wise uh, to them, they have a natural tendency to want to connect. So it's not actually something that I have to focus in on. It's something that when we lay this, this, um, this foundational layer of safety uh, for our nervous systems, there is a natural inclination for social engagement. And I now have the skill set of self-protection so that I can connect. So today's topic is a little bit more about connection, 
um, but I'm still going to really focus on, on, on that protection thing uh, nonetheless. So those of you who may be familiar uh, with uh, Judith Herman's Stages of Trauma Recovery, uh, in her book Trauma and Recovery, highly recommend it if you haven't, she really focuses on this first uh, phase of establishing safety in the present. And um, I look very much at objective measures. Uh, objective measures are very helpful for the trauma survivor themselves. And what we're really looking at is tangibly and measurably increasing uh, safe coping skills, there's 84 safe coping skills in uh, seeking safety that we look at, um, actively increasing self-regulation skills, and actively increasing self-care, safe self-care. And then a measurable decrease in trauma symptoms using that trauma symptom checklist 40, and a measurable decrease in unsafe behaviors, as reported by the client or uh, with a tool such as the unsafe behaviors inventory. And that this phase is the essential phase um, and that Judith Herman says the past focused phase where we uncover the past trauma is a voluntary stage that many people choose to step over. And then we've got this third phase. And I'm just going to focus in on the third phase for a minute because the third phase, which she calls reconnection, reconnection to your future, it's an investment in one's future that I'm looking at how my behaviors and my decisions today affect my future include seeing relationships as enduring. Um, the trauma survivor, as a general trauma theme, often sees relationships as transactional. Uh, what have you done for me lately? Um, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You're making me happy, so I'm going to give you something. You're not making me happy, so I'm not going to give you anything. I'm going to take something back. Uh, we can see this kind of endemic in our society where um, many people actually just work from the assumption that relationships are transactional. And in fact, some relationships are transactional. But it's in this stage, Judith Thurman says, where we can start to see uh, relationships enduring even when I'm disappointed or even when I don't behave my best or even when there is a calamity or a, a serious situation that we have to focus in on, that this relationship is enduring in spite of all that, uh, that our connection to each other uh, is going to endure and last beyond uh, uh, the give and take of transactional uh, relational stances. So, Another aspect for us to look at in terms of the safety business as foundational is the neurosequential model by Bruce Perry. Um, and in it, he really focuses in, again, on this brainstem, which is where our vagal nerve comes from, that this, um, this largely nonverbal part of our brain, in fact, the only uh, sounds that this part of the brain is able to produce are protective utterances, like, like hissing or, or gagging sounds. Um, uh, rather than emotional sounds or cognitive symbolic uh, language sounds. So uh, this largely nonverbal uh, part of our brain is really interested in detecting patterns, uh, giving ourselves the ability to uh, scan our environment while still attending to uh, focused activities in the here and now. And where we see problems in this part of the brain are problems of self-regulation, attention, arousal, and impulsivity. And uh, that is where a lot of uh, sex swings of extremes of no sex or too much sex, uh, zero sex, unsafe sex, um, where these kind of swings of extremes uh, tend to have a lot of um, saliency. So uh, that I, I can't self-regulate uh, around other people, so I'm isolated. I can't self-regulate until I have this biological release. Uh, so I have to go, in order for me to function, I have to go out there and, and, and have this biological release, and then I can do these other things like, like working on my taxes or, or dealing with this thing with my child or whatever it is. Uh, we can also see that sexuality uh, requires some attention, attention to what we're doing and how we're doing it. And if I have a hard time attending to myself, I'm not going to want to put myself in that situation. Or if it takes my attention away from other things that are disturbing me, uh, it functions in that opposite extreme way. Arousal. You know, we even use the word arousal for sexuality, and, and very often uh, people use the word arousal to kind of uh, broadly implicate, you know, what we generally call a little bit more uh, colloquially uh, horniness, uh, that we use it almost as a, a synonym to, to, to kind of being horny, uh, arousal. Uh, but really, in terms of the nervous system, arousal is talking about a hyper aroused or a hypo aroused nervous system that we're perceiving our environments to be threatening and therefore. Um, engaging in survival-based behaviors. So um, I really want to see 
is the sexuality in, in myself and my clients uh, behavior an, an, uh, able to kind of regulate, downregulate or upregulate their nervous system? And while that is, uh, you know, perfectly fine if it's working and safe, um, if it's not working and if it's not safe, we can find some other ways to uh, reduce this uh, hyper or hypo aroused nervous system. And then we have this impulsivity. Uh, so generally, uh, with my clients, we talk about impulsivity as you know, kind of kind of body signal commands that we have a very hard time not listening to. Take it, eat it, do it, you know, uh, uh, have sex with it. <laughs> uh, that there are these very very strong command or imperative body signals um, that uh, become very very difficult not to obey. So I, I want people to start to understand that these are actually physiological body signals that are telling us something. And one of the things that it may be telling us is that we're not safe uh, and that we're using sex or lack of sex, uh, intimacy, lack of intimacy, uh, relationships, lack of a relationships, too many relationships, too few relationships as a way to try to regulate our nervous system. And that makes us dependent on other people. Uh, even if I'm trying to become independent of other people, I'm still dependent on them because they have so much power in my life. And then we also see uh, that there's, um, uh, I call them kind of unipolar uh, emotions or body signals that kind of emerge from this part of the brain. Uh, and they're really all about me and all about my self-preservation. Anger, aggression, fear, disgust, hunger, fatigue, horniness um, are all uh, kind of uh, produced, if you will, in this brainstem diencephalon uh, or reptilian part of the brain. And, um, and we often, you know, as a culture, kind of think of these things as lesser body signals. Um, even though they're designed exclusively to protect me and to help me survive, uh, we often don't want to kind of uh, acknowledge that we have these needs or that we have these body signals. Um, instead, we're much more interested if you go up one section to the limbic structure, this is the more relational part of our brain, um, trust, shame, loyalty, jealousy, betrayal, flirtation, loss, hatred. These are our dual polar um, uh, body signals where it's me and you kind of involved in this body signal. And uh, we tend to kind of um, uh, think of these as, as higher level body signals. Uh, but you know, once again, I'm going to go back to the self-preservation and the brainstem thing and really talk about how um, our bodies are designed for us, they're on our side, they're here to help us, and that if they're sending us these messages, it's in order to protect us and to help us survive. What is causing our body to say these things? Is it past patterns? Is it current new situations? And what's interesting is that Bruce Perry says any pattern of repetitive somatosensory activity can reorganize this part of the brain. Well, one of the most patterned repetitive somatosensory activities that I can even think about is uh, sexual activity, uh, where we tend to have rhythms, uh, we tend to do it kind of over and over again, and sometimes we get into some stuck repetitive patterns uh, with sexual activity, and it's engaging my body uh, very clearly, and it's engaging my senses and my perception. So we can see how individuals who engage in sex can often benefit from it, that it's organizing a part of their brain that's often disorganized, and they can function afterwards. That my compulsion to uh, engage in sex gives me the benefit of being able to function afterwards, relationally with my other relationships, for example, or um, in terms of my job or my focus or, or what I'm trying to do. So you know, once again, we're really trying to figure out um, uh, the need, the purpose, and how trauma kind of creates a context around why that behavior is an attempt to meet a need, but if it's unsafe and unproductive, it actually keeps us trapped in that dynamic. So this is just a, a little bit more information about that neurosequential model by Bruce Perry, uh, where uh, uh, that there's these kind of three interde inter interdependent or um, uh, structurally dependent aspects of our brain where we move up from the reptilian to the mammalian, which is misspelled, and I apologize, uh, to the primate uh, part of the brain. Uh, but it's really in here that I, I, that I honestly want to stay, uh, which is, um, does my client have the ability to self-regulate, to self-protect, to self-direct? Um, are they able to become aware using their five senses, uh, use their motor muscle, muscles for action, for rhythmic behavior, for routine behavior? Uh, are they able to attend to their environment? And can they make protective utterances, including the word no, which is kind of like our human uh, protective utterance, uh, much like a hiss, 
which is really that snake saying no. Uh, so I really want to focus here before I get up into this relational business or into this more abstract or cognitive business. And I just feel that very often we, we, we kind of skip over this stuff way too fast uh, without giving people that neurobiological sense of safety. So there's a lot of skills for the trauma survivor to learn. Um, these actually can be very positive, enjoyable skills. They don't have to be, you know, terrible, terrible skills that the person has to do, which, um, uh, you know, unfortunately has been a strong message that, that trauma recovery is painful and difficult and fraught with all kinds of setbacks and, uh, you know, you can't use substances and you, you have to kind of white knuckle it and, you know, oh, you know, it just sounds, it sounds terrible. So um, instead, you know, we really want to focus on how trauma recovery can actually uh, engage the senses increase enjoyment, allow people to live uh, a fruitful and, and, and happy existence in the here and now, starting right now. So mm, on the goal side, these are the core values that SAMHSA has determined, uh, updating it in 2014, of uh, what it means to be trauma-informed. And again, I'm just going to say disclosure and processing of trauma is uh, a, a way that some people may decide that they want to um, recover from trauma, but it, it cannot be uh, the prescription for uh, trauma recovery. Uh, it can be an option, but it can't be the prescription. So we've really moved beyond past-focused trauma narrative therapy and really moving much more into active skills building uh, so that people can exist, protect themselves, stay safe, and have uh, safe relationships in their lives today. Um, so you can see that each one of these core values I have kind of translated into a set of skills. Building safe coping skills, becoming more transparent, becoming known to someone, identifying and building safe connections, work on something you care about with others who care about the same thing, developing personal power, which is the ability to speak and act autonomously, and accepting messages that help and disregarding messages that hurt. For our purposes, we can see sexuality and intimacy being directly related to all these skills. That I want to build safe coping skills, the ability to say no and set boundaries in relationships. That if I feel that I am only going to get love if I am sexually available and I can't say no, otherwise I'm going to be deprived love, um, that's going to set me up for some serious uh, unsafe relationships. So we're going to build these safe coping skills uh, to become more transparent, to become known to somebody. Um, I'm wondering, you know, for the very sexually active individual, if they become known to somebody before sex or if it's, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you will, that sexuality still maintains a certain, uh, a certain coverage or a certain cover story or a certain amount of, of, of identity protection, even though I might be fully naked with this individual, they don't know who I am, they don't know uh, what I do or what I think or what my core values are in my life. So I'm wondering if maybe by becoming just a little bit more transparent, a little bit more known to somebody, we can actually uh, move towards our opposite, uh, both directions. Um, sexuality does not necessarily have to be a part of it, but it can be uh, a part of it as well. Uh, identifying and building safe connections. Uh, I use the word safe connections instead of relationships because um, these are safe harbors. Uh, this is a place where uh, people are not transactional with me, uh, where I am able to uh, present myself, my needs, uh, my problems, my concerns, and they are listening to those things without applying their uh, needs, uh, concerns, worries on top of them. Uh, these safe connections are rare. There are not a lot of them around. Uh, and if you have them and you can identify them, uh, they are a source of trauma recovery and are truly, truly precious. But we can build them. Um, very often as helping professionals, we tend to be uh, safe connections for people. And so then the recovery skill is really building these safe connections for us. Uh, is there somebody out there, uh, you know, whether that person might be a therapist or a, a good friend or a family member, you know, is there somebody out there that we can actually uh, come to and have them fully um, listen to our needs uh, without applying their needs on top of it. Uh, relationships tend to be a lot more murky and both people's needs are valid, uh, so there isn't that kind of uh, focus on just you, just me uh, in that moment. Um, we also see working on something you care about with others who care about the same thing in terms of sexuality, sex itself. Hey, 
uh, here we are working on this sex stuff right here, you and me, uh, that sexuality is actually something that a lot of people care about, something that I care about, and it is a source of trauma recovery. Um, but is it is it because we care about this thing, or is it because that I feel that I have to um, do this in order to get another need met, uh, which is going to actually relate to the next one, my ability to develop personal power, the ability to speak and act autonomously. No to protect, yes to connect. Do I go through a mental calculation? What will this person think about me if I say no? Uh, what will happen to me and are, will terrible things happen to me if I don't say yes? That that is a sign of relational power as opposed to personal power. So, um, you know, before I engage in a relationship with somebody, um, sexual or otherwise, you know, I want to make sure that they are able to speak and act autonomously. So I want to hear them say no to me sometimes. I want to say no to them sometimes to see how do they act. Uh, are they offended when I say, no, I don't have time today uh, to meet up with you? Uh, if so, not only does that tell me that they are lacking self-protection and self-regulation skills, uh, but that it's actually probably kind of a dangerous environment for me to go into as well. So I'm really, really interested in this word no um, as a part of sexual um, experience and, and, and sexual autonomy. And then finally, accepting messages that help and disregarding messages that hurt. So here, uh, we've got these cultural, historical, and gendered messages that often are weighing us down, keeping us down, uh, promoting behaviors that are unsafe. And uh, we can go through and actually examine some of the cultural messages that have been uh, given to women, to men, to people who identify as um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Uh, we can actually examine these messages and the skill set for the trauma survivor is to actually see uh, what is helpful in that message. Uh, believe it or not, even negative messages have power that we can uh, take and that can help us. And uh, we can disregard the aspects of those messages that hurt us, keep us down, keep us unsafe, keep us denying our needs. Now, I, I really am noticing the time, so I want to uh, help us start to kind of move through a couple of these slides so I can answer some questions if anybody has any. So mm, what, what we're doing, and this is based on um, Janina Fisher's work, um, her uh, trauma stabilization treatment, uh, which is I want to start noticing uh, when people are in a blocked, stuck, all or nothing, life or death, black and white, um, it's all going great, it's all going terrible, kind of uh, habituated response of understanding their context, their body signals, and the synthesized evaluation that they give. Every man is uh, you know, going to cheat, or every woman is uh, a liar. Uh, these kind of things, I want to constantly notice these, these things in order to help people shift to the here and now, uh, identify these responses as very often symptomatic of our nervous systems signaling to us that, that something is reminding us or maybe even actually uh, unsafe to us. And then I want to provide a lot of psychoeducation and schemas in order to help people to start to see themselves. Janina Fisher says this wakens up our frontal lobes so that we can start to understand ourselves, shift that context just a little bit differently. Um, I also want to notice the immobilization reaction that people have when physical safety is threatened, uh, encoded in our nervous system, and disorganized reactivity when emotional safety is threatened. And I want to encourage action. Get out of there uh, when it's physically unsafe. Call for help. Scream, yell, fight back. Um, but then to encourage mindfulness and curiosity when it's not an external threat, but there's this internal situation. Is it truly unsafe? And then ultimately, um, uh, probably uh, most important for us to all shift towards our opposite is this understanding that safety is the goal. Uh, it's not a precursor to treatment so that I stabilize my client only to get them dysregulated uh, in terms of interpersonal or narrative or past focused or, 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 or trauma uh, kind of exposure therapy, but that the goal is nervous system regulation so that people's bodies can function, so that their social engagement system comes online, so that they can connect to their future. So the goal is consistent with all clients, that we're going to move slowly, consistently, building the skills to be able to scaffold up this movement towards our opposite. Uh, a, a little bit safer, uh, a little bit more connected. A little bit safer, a little bit more connected. Also, um, we want to practice uh, a phrase that I call radical informed consent. 
uh, which is you know, constantly allowing ourselves to hear verbal consent from our clients. And if my client is already a very compliant type, I have to consistently say, you can say no in a way that is non-humiliating, that doesn't make them lose their self-respect or that impairs this relationship. Uh, so again, this no word comes in. So radical informed consent, I actually think it's more appropriate to call it radical informed dissent, that we want to be able to dissent uh, so that we know we can consent. And um, uh, Tom has made available uh, the tra Trauma Survivors Bill of Rights. It's all about consent, um, and it implies a lot of dissent. So I, I want to definitely um, encourage you guys to, to use this Trauma Survivors Bill of Rights. And maybe, you know, I hadn't really thought about it, but perhaps it could be a Bill of Rights for sexual partners as well. Uh, that would be fascinating to look at it from that uh, perspective. So um, I'm, I'm actually kind of at the end of, of uh, this presentation. I don't have a lot of time. I'm actually in the middle of a larger presentation here in, in uh, Salt Lake City. But I was wondering if there are any questions, um, any comments, um, if anybody wants to tell me what they found helpful or unhelpful, um, I'm happy to hear what folks have to say. Um, Feel free to uh, type your questions in the chat window to the left. And why don't I go ahead and open up the audio? Um, this will just take me a second. Sure, sure, for sure. And then I just want to let people know while that's going on. Uh, that in Santa Cruz we do have a conference on Thursday, uh, and wherever you are in the world uh, to consider making a trip to Santa Cruz uh, uh, for this wonderful conference. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So I am not hearing any messages or any uh, questions. Um, this, uh, do you think phase two in treatment is advised? Um, stage two meaning the past focused treatment. Uh, do, do I think that, that that's advised? I think it's optional. I think, I think it's, you know, many, many folks feel that going back in the past and exploring uh, maybe with some new resources and tools, maybe with a witness uh, is a very powerful way for them to recover from trauma, totally optional. Once safety has been created, now we can take risks. Once safety is there, now we can actually do things um, that we were too scared, too blocked, too afraid, too threatened to try. So yeah, sure, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that that's a goal, that safety is there in order for people to go back into the past. I think that's um, a message that we really need to stop. Um, conveying and, and supporting. Get safe and then uh, do whatever you want to do, <laughs> and including past focus treatment. Gabriella, would it be all right to uh, provide a link to your PowerPoint slides? Someone had asked us that. Sure, absolutely. Okay, great. Okay. Well, everybody, I want to say thank you very much from, from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I'm in the middle of a presentation, pretty much the same presentation without the emphasis on sex, and uh, they're probably expecting me back pretty soon. So I want to bid everybody thank you uh, from around the world. I really appreciate it, and thank you for all your hard work. Hope to see you in October in Santa Cruz. Uh, thanks a lot. Bye. Great. Thank you so much, Gabriella. We really appreciate it. Great. Great presentation. Can't wait to get it up on YouTube. That'll be on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com backslash Center for Healthy Sex. And hey. join us next month. Uh, it'll be Doug Sorensen. He's going to lecture on recovery from mother and meshed men, covert sexual trauma consequences, and shame resiliency needs. Again, thanks so much, Gabriella, and thank you everyone for attending.